Salam sejahtera and a very good afternoon to all attendees who are now watching this event via Facebook or YouTube. We wish everyone well. I'm Ivy Tan Xiang from the School of Education, Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities, University, University Technology, Malaysia. It is my pleasure to be the MC for today's event. Today's event is made up of two very special segments. First, we are honored to have Datuk Dr. Habiba Abdul Rahim, the Director General of Education, Ministry of Education Malaysia, to officiate our very first Parents Guideline for Learning at Home. After that, we will have the privilege of having Datuk talk about school leadership in times of crisis, which is a topic that is really relevant to us as educators and academics. Before we begin, I would like to invite every one of you to like our event and share it with your friends and students. To kick off today's event, let us welcome the Dean of Social Sciences and Humanities Faculty, Professor Dr. Zaira Tuntasil, for her welcome speech. Welcome, Prof. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum. Thank you very much, Dr. Tan, as our uh, moderator for today's uh, to Yang Berbahagia, Datuk Dr. Habibah Abdul Rahim, our, uh, our adjunct uh, professors of Faculty of Social Science and Humanities, also as the Director General of Education, Ministry of Education Malaysia, course together with us also the Chair of School of Education, Professor Fatin Ali Pang, and also to all the staff of the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities, and of course to all our audience, students who are together with us through Facebook and YouTube for today's uh, sessions of our adjunct lecture series 11 with the title of school leadership in times of crisis together with the event today we have the launching of the parents guideline for learning at home so everybody knows that early this year COVID-19 has slammed the door firmly shut on all aspects of every, everyday life it's interrupted international travels it devastated economic growth and it's disrupted schooling globally in just a few short months COVID-19 has been a supernova, creating undeniable chaos and shaking the very fabrics of education. It has redefined learning as a remote, screen-based activity, limiting most learners to online teacher support. And according to UNESCO, 1.6 billion young people have been out of school during this crisis and as uh, some, uh, Zhao has pointed out that virtually all schools have been paused and teaching has been significantly reorganized. So for school teacher working in this demanding and chaotic circumstances, the pressure is relentless, the options are limited, the sleepless nights are frequent. Parents, students and teachers now exist in the twilight education world either awaiting the returns of normal service or hoping for some new normals that might offer stability, continuity and reassurance. And today, the 1st of April 2021, uh, as a government servant, especially at UTM, we actually work back, work, uh, back at, at our work 100% and because uh, we are almost, I think, more than one year, we are not actually working 100% at the office. This can change almost overnight, depending on how the virus develops and simultaneously school leaders are dealing with fluids and changing staffing situations, meaning they are having to do much more with less. The social distancing of staff and students mean extra works and extra pressure on those staff who can return to work. Every expectation either from above or below ask more of school leaders professionally and personally. personally. So school leaders are caught in the unfavorable positions of being the pinch point in the system and they are reliant on guidance about COVID-19 response, process, procedure, protocol from above. And the launching of parents' guidelines for learning at home today is actually part of UTM, specifically the School of Education, Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities, corporate social responsibility to, to the society and to the worlds of education. So uh, school leaders on this journey are defined by their determinations, their hopes and their unshakable belief what 
that what have whatever happens whatever the cause whatever the skills or the challenge they will continue to do everything in their power to safeguard the learning of of all young people and teachers and school leaders across malaysia should be congratulated for the tremendous job they have done rising to the challenge that the pandemic has presented to their school this is not easy it has been humbling to see how the whole malaysia education system has adapted and in many places transformed in response to such challenging time so today uh, our adjunct lecture series delivered by yang berbahagia datuk dr habiba abdul rahim with the title of school leadership in times of crisis is actually an important topics that we should focus and see how actually the school leader has sacrificed their time to make sure that our malaysia education runs smoothly at these events of covid-19 pandemic so all the best to all the school leaders and teachers and thank you very much yang berbahagia datuk dr habiba abdul rahim for sharing uh, he, uh, her view on uh, to represent the ministry of education on this topic kudos to all of you may allah bless your commitment and effort thank you very much i end my welcoming remarks with wabillahi taufiq wal hidayah wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh oh thank you prof for her warm and high spirited welcome speech now now is the time for me to invite our honorable guest the director general of education ministry of education malaysia and our adjunct professor yang bahagia datuk dr habiba abdul rahim to deliver her opening speech and officiate the launching of parents guideline for learning at home prepared by academics of the school of education headed by dr hasna muhammad as the project leader Let's give a big hand or send your loves and likes to welcome Dato. Thank you Dr Tan. Assalamualaikum and a very good afternoon Professor Dr Zaidatun Tasir Dean Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities University Technology Malaysia Professor Dr Fatin Alia Pang Abdullah Chair School of Education Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities University Technology Malaysia Alhamdulillah, we are here today to witness an effort uh, at a time of a uh, crisis to provide continuous support towards learning. As we know, in 2020, COVID-19 uh, had impacted everyone. And in every area, including education, the impact is not just in Malaysia, but also globally. It has affected on how we normally work. Schools were forced to shut and learning were conducted home-based. The Ministry of Education had to think of ways to provide support for teachers and students. However, parents at home were also first timers at managing and supporting uh, their child learning from home. Parents juggle between working from home and supporting their child's learning, which is quite a challenge. Understanding the challenges parents were facing, University Technology Malaysia and Jabatan Pelajaran Negeri Johor had worked together and initiated to develop a parents guideline for learning at home its aim is to provide guidelines and tips for parents to assist and enable learning for their child at home it also emphasizes on physical and mental health for parents this guideline is in the form of infographics to assist understanding uh, it is multilingual in both malay english a mandarin as well as tamil to reach out to multiracial audiences in malaysia looking at the hard work and effort being put into producing this guideline i sincerely hope that parents would find it to be useful and can be applied effectively to create a con con uh, sorry conducive learning environment at home for your children My sincere appreciation towards the School of Education, Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities, University Technology Malaysia, and Jabatan Pelajaran Negeri Johor for this timely effort. Without further ado, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I officially launch the Parents Guideline for Learning at Home. Thank you.
Well, our heartfelt gratitude to Dato for your opening speech and launching of our first Learning at Home Parent and Guide. Thank you so much, Dato. And our appreciation also goes to Dr. Shaharuddin for his creative and wonderful montage presentation. Dear attendees, the Parents' Guideline for Learning at Home is now available for download on our faculty's website at humanities.utm.my slash total. The direct download link can be found in the comment section of this event on Facebook and YouTube. And now we come to the segment of today's event that many of us have been looking forward to, a sharing by Dato, titled School Leadership in Times of Crisis. Now, this is an 11th session in our series of adjunct professor lectures and also Dato's third online sharing session with us. Throughout this session, please feel free to post your comments or questions in the comment section, whether you are following us on Facebook or YouTube. Dato will be more than happy to answer your question and to reply to your comments after her sharing. Also, in the comment section is the link for UTM staff and students to sign in for your attendance. Again, please remember to like this event and share it with those who might be interested to join in. Now, without further ado, let us welcome the moderator of today's session, Professor Dr. Fatin Aliapang, who is currently the Chair of School of Education. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar with him, Professor Fatin obtained her PhD in education from the University of Cambridge and her area of specialties include STEM education and environmental education. Over to you, Prof Fatin. Okay, thank you, Dr Tan. Thanks for the kind introduction. How are you? Okay. Um, today, we're going to have our lecture, uh, professor lecture series uh, with our esteemed uh, guest who is uh, Dato Dr. Haibi Abdurrahim. Uh, just a, a brief uh, introduction of our speaker. Uh, she is our Director General of Education, uh, the number 17th Director of General uh, of Education under Ministry of Education. Uh, she has a PhD uh, in Education from the University of Stanford, US, which is among the top university in the world in education. She started as a biology, te biology teacher and she has been headed a few, she has been headed a few uh, departments and uh, sectors in the Ministry of Education, including uh, PADU uh, and also the EPRD Education Planning and, and Research Dev Division. So uh, please welcome Dr. Abiba. Hello. Hello Hakeem. Hakeem. How are you? <laughs> thank you for joining you. us today. Uh, thank you. Uh, we are really look forward for your talk, and uh, I want to thank you again for launching uh, the the guideline for parents. Is it going to be uh, something that can be useful because it's a it's infographic. I think parents from all age, uh, from any level of education, should be able to read. And we prepared in four languages. Thank you, Dato, for launching it. Uh, so over to Dato for today's uh, topic on school leadership in times of crisis. Very timely topic. Please, Dato. Thank you, Prof. Atin. Let me just share the presentation slides. Okay. School leadership in times of crisis, uh, what has been the situation like from 2020 up to now? I think in around March uh, 2020, uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic had spread uh, worldwide, where more than 1.4 million learners were affected. In 167 countries nationwide, there were school closures. So if we look roughly at the map uh, from uh, UNESCO, we see that in March 2020, uh, most of the schools were closed. Uh, those are the ones indicated uh, in purple and some were partially, only partially open, the ones in pink. Uh, so the situation um, were also felt uh, in Malaysia, where Malaysia had imposed a nationwide movement control order 
uh, on the 18th of March 2020 uh, that has resulted in school closures, including post-secondary uh, uh, and our um, ed other education institutions. So in total, there were 48 uh, school days that were uh, closed uh, and we did not have any face-to-face -face learning. This is excluding uh, school holidays and other uh, holidays as well. Um, so this has impacted uh, more than 10,000 schools. Uh, and if we include uh, our all our institutions, schools plus all other institutions under the Ministry of Education, uh, it impacted uh, more than 5 million students and more than 400,000 uh, teachers. So as I have said, 48 days uh, were without face-to-face uh, -face learning in schools um, and 150 days of face-to-face -face schooling. So there has been interruption as well as going back to school and closure again uh, when the situation um, requires that we close schools. So when uh, the first MCO was announced, it was the school uh, holiday then. Uh, but after two weeks uh, of MCO, and it was further extended, so the ministry could no longer continue uh, to keep the schools closed. Uh, because it was already uh, the school term. Uh, then again, how do we uh, continue to provide learning uh, to children when the situation does not allow for our children as well as our teachers uh, to do the usual teaching and learning within the physical uh, classroom? So the ministry had to come up with a circular to request teachers to continue teaching and learning, but home-based, or some may call it uh, remote learning. Um, at that point of time, we were not ready. We were definitely not ready because the traditional or the usual way of learning has always been face-to-face and in the physical classroom, to suddenly ask our teachers um, and our students to now do home-based learning requires a lot of effort on the part of our teachers, on the part of our students, as well as on parents, uh, because parents themselves were not ready. So what has this implied? It, there may have been likelihood that students learning against the formal curriculum were not fully covered because of the closure of schools. Much of the curricula cannot be adapted quickly enough so that home-based learning can happen smoothly. Uh, students may face the anxiety of not knowing how their schooling year will progress because we definitely did not plan it to happen that way. Teachers and students were definitely not prepared with the sudden shift to home-based learning. And parents too, I think, were uh, having a lot of stress because they too need to work at home and at the same time uh, oversee their children's learning from home. Other than the students' learning time, affected is the assessment. For the SPM and STPM, for instance, we had to reschedule uh, the exams three times compared to the original date dates that were set. For SPM, it moved from 2020 to 2021, and along the way, it shifted three times. So, but in the end, we finally managed to do our SPM from 22nd of uh, February up to the 25th of March. I think it was a success because based on the number 
of uh, candidates for the SPM, uh, we had uh, over 401,000 candidates. Uh, but in terms of numbers that will need to receive, uh, not receive, which needs to sit for the next session because either they were positive or they were under quarantine uh, with uh, proper letters, medical letters, they can sit uh, for the second sitting. And this is the first time ever that the SPM is offered in two sittings. So that will uh, cover 0.74% uh, of the candidates. So this number is very small. It's below uh, less than 3,000 uh, candidates. So in all, we are very uh, appreciative. The ministry appreciates the effort given uh, by uh, the various layers uh, to ensure that the SPM uh, managed to be rolled out, including the parents to ensure the safety and health uh, of the candidates. Um, at the same time, the UPSR uh, at the end of primary level had to be cancelled for 2020 and the PT3 2020 had to be cancelled as well. Um, so selection to specific schools, uh, which previously had used the UPSR and PT3 results as part of the selection process, had to be um, adapted so that uh, selection can still happen, but via a different approach. So the ministry introduced the Pentaksiran Khusus Sekolah Khusus uh, or the PKSK uh, to ensure that the process is smooth and using specific criteria uh, to enable selection to these specific uh, schools. So while we acknowledge that the closure of schools uh, reduce the likelihood of COVID-19 to infect and spread among school children, teachers um, who are considered the vulnerable group, especially the school children. Nonetheless, the closure of these schools would most likely cause a huge loss of learning, uh, which will lead to disengagement, especially among those at risk of dropping out and the vulnerable groups. This would include uh, the B40s, um, the special education needs children, as well as the orang asli children. For instance, when school first reopened after uh, the MCO, we went to school, the ministry went to school and asked how did the um, home-based learning happen when the school were closed. So definitely it varies among schools and among classes within the schools. And among those we saw that were affected were uh, the B40 uh, children, definitely uh, the ones that I've mentioned, the special education needs and the Orang Asli uh, students. Uh, there are also other vulnerable groups, but those were the main ones. And the sudden move towards home-based learning uh, may also have created learning gaps among students due to the variances in instructional quality, uh, instructional time, and reach. Social emotional support in times of crisis was also lacking for teachers and students. So how has been the situation a year on? Many countries had begun reopening schools, uh, and this also include uh, schools in Malaysia, uh, which have opened and are opening up in stages. Uh, and as we can see from the mapping again, there are a lot more that are partially open um, uh, now in 2021 as compared to the previous uh, map that we see uh, from UNESCO. So in Malaysia, uh, we opened uh, in 2021 for the exam classes, uh, cohort uh, 2020, uh, that started in January. But 
for all other students. We started with the primary schools on the 1st and on the 8th of March. And that would cover 7,780 uh, primary schools. Vocational colleges also opened in March, uh, but the secondary schools uh, would start on the 4th or 5th of April 2021, covering 2,356 uh, secondary schools. So by the 4th and 5th of April, all our schools, either preschool, primary, or secondary schools would be uh, open. So in this lockdown, education has been rebooted as a home base, technology enabled, remote activity with zero physical contact. Uh, yes. So the impact of COVID-19, we see that the sudden closure of schools has also accelerated the use of digital devices and connectivity. So in the case of Malaysia, we already started the dilemma or educational, uh, edu uh, digital educational learning initiative Malaysia uh, in 2019, and we launched it uh, in 2020. So it was a timely uh, effort where the dilemma provides the platform uh, for the Ministry of Education, for the students, as well as the teachers, where within the platform, we have got various applications, uh, as well as education resources. And this includes videos of teaching and learning. It includes the digital textbooks, as well as other resource materials, um, uh, especially we also have our EduWeb TV at the platform. Uh, and if we see the progression in terms of the number of logins, uh, we have close to 90% of our teachers logged uh, in, onto the Lima and uh, close to 70% of our students also logged onto uh, the Lima. So based on how it has progressed, from January up to close to the end of last year, uh, we see um, quite a huge uh, increase in terms of the number of teachers that were uh, locked on and using uh, the dilemma. And definitely among the students, we see uh, almost a doubling in the number that are locked on and using uh, the dilemma. So this has been very encouraging. Nevertheless, in terms of digital uh, education or digital learning, um, the effort by the Ministry of Education has been towards school, where we provide uh, computers, especially in our computer labs, uh, connectivity to ensure it's uh, provided to all schools, primary, secondary, urban, rural, However, during the COVID-19 situation, when uh, learning had to happen home-based or remotely, they are, our teachers and our students are no longer in schools. They are at home. So those devices are not reachable uh, to them. And when we did a survey, uh, when the ministry conducted a survey, uh, to almost uh, 700,000 uh, parents and uh, more than 900,000 students, we see that many of our families, uh, especially the students, do not have access to these devices. 36% um, either at the urban or rural area, do not have any form of device uh, in order for um, digital learning to happen. And depending on the device, either the PC, tablet, or laptop, or even handphones, there's a clear divide between the urban and rural areas. So 
the most widely uh, access form of uh, communication is the handphone. And even in the ownership of handphone, there's a difference in terms of who owns the handphone. There are more secondary students who have their own handphones, but there's more sharing among the primary uh, students in terms of uh, usage uh, of the handphones. So if within the family, um, there's only one or two that's accessible, but there are more than two within the family uh, uh, of siblings, then uh, you know uh, whose turn is it in using the device would be an issue and that it would lead to disruption uh, in learning. So although students are able to gain access to online learning via the digital platform, there are many other factors that impede their learning via this platform, especially uh, the ownership of gadgets or devices and the internet uh, connectivity. As we can see uh, in the internet speed, there's a gap between uh, urban and rural areas. So whilst the ministry acknowledges that there are students who do not have access to internet as well as the appropriate technological devices, there are several other approaches uh, that has been used uh, for home-based learning. We do have offline uh, learning that uh, happens without the use of internet, either in using devices or not. Uh, we do have textbooks that's, uh, that are available. Uh, modules, uh, self-assessed learning materials. Some schools provide modules that are left in certain designated areas, either near the school or in community uh, centers that parents can then pick up for their children, return and pick up uh, others to continue with the learning. There's also off-site. Uh, learning that happens uh, in locations, including community centers, in libraries, in surals. So we have uh, good exemplars, for instance, of teachers uh, going into the Orang Asli uh, community in providing support uh, in learning in those uh, communities. So they go uh, once or twice in a week to provide support other than the learning materials that are provided to them uh, to learn by themselves. Um, so this kind of uh, either offline, offline uh, supplements uh, the effort that we do through online learning. And we know that online learning is not accessible to all. So these other approaches would help uh, to reach uh, the other students as well. Now, uh, I did mention that the Dilemma also has web, based, uh, web TV on the platform. Uh, so the ministry once had a TV pendidikan, educational TV, that is terrestrial, but we have moved from terrestrial to web-based. But considering that more than one-third of our school population do not have access uh, to these digital devices, the ministry had to bring back uh, the educational TV program because we know that more than 98% of our households do actually have uh, television sets. Uh, so we started bringing back terrestrial TV programs uh, on a two-hour daily basis, which expanded towards the end of the year in 20. Uh, 20 to a total of 11 hours. And this year, early part of this year, we also launched a dedicated uh, educational TV channel um, daily from 7 a.m. to 12 p.m. Uh, to support uh, learning at home. And we hope that our concept is for lifelong learning. So whether uh, in the future we do not require, for instance, home-based learning uh, as it is now because schools are closed, uh, these educational programs can still provide uh, forms of learning 
uh, to our community uh, so that it can become a channel that provides a uh, lifelong learning and learning can happen both in school as well as out of school. Now, our study shows that teachers' ability to adapt in delivering home-based learning uh, is very much dependent upon their skills, their knowledge, their ability to adapt to such approach. Uh, and it varies greatly uh, among teachers. So 46% of teachers believe that the environment at home is not suitable to carry out home-based uh, teaching and learning, or close to 53% teachers uh, feel that um, they have low level of skills in utilizing digital innovation in carrying out uh, lessons. 97% of teachers prefer to use WhatsApp in carrying out home-based teaching. So we do not know what's the impact of using WhatsApp in teaching. 93% um, of teachers only completed 80% uh, of the syllabus. So at most, uh, you know, of 80% uh, coverage of the syllabus, that means there's a gap of 20%. Uh, these are for the group of teachers uh, that do manage to complete at least 80%, but there are also teachers that have not managed to cover as much. So the COVID-19 had certainly changed how we perceive what is usually normal within the educational context. Now the new normal brought about by the COVID-19 have significantly expanded the implications and concreteness of the term VOCA. I think when we first uh, speak about the term VUCA, it's applied to uh, the situation created by the digital technology uh, and what we call also the fourth industrial revolution, the era that we are in. But the COVID-19 situation is also reflective of the term VUCA. So how do I see this? VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So in terms of volatility, changes due to VUCA are taking place every day. It is unpredictable, dramatic, and fast, especially when in 2020, when we did not understand the situation in 2021, we understand it a little bit more. So changes have happened, although the situation uh, may remain the same while we are still facing the COVID-19, but through our understanding, uh, perhaps the decisions that we are making uh, have also changed as well. But certainty, certainly the volatility has caused school closures because we want to ensure safety and health uh, of our students as well as our teachers. Operations of schools uh, could also be dependent on the local infection rate. For instance, we had to close uh, districts, uh, we had to close certain areas uh, within districts, and we also had to close larger areas, for instance, states. Secondly, uncertainty. No one can predict with confidence when the pandemic will end or when we will have a cure or vaccination while we are trying uh, towards 70 to 80 percent uh, of the people in Malaysia to be vaccinated yeah, and create the herd uh, immunity. But for education, certainly it creates difficulty in planning activities in school because of the sudden cancellation based on the directives that we receive. And especially when, uh, you know, uh, in, when there are increases and it requires our schools to be closed. 
Thirdly, complexity. The pandemic is certainly affecting all aspects of schooling life in complex ways, uh, meeting a variety of needs to protect student and staff safety, uh, learning needs, as well as social emotional support. So this has been complex situations that our schools now have to meet in order uh, to provide a safe and environment uh, for teaching and learning to happen. And fourth, ambiguity. There is no one best practice or solution schools can follow to manage uh, the challenges caused by the pandemic. And I believe this is acknowledged uh, globally as well. So where one may be successful in a certain uh, country or area, it may not be so in another country, for instance. While we may uh, track what other countries are doing, but uh, you know it has to be uh, localized to how it is affecting our own country and communities. So the communication of information and the understanding of the information uh, that we have communicated uh, must be fast as well as accurate uh, to ensure you know um, SOPs to ensure compliance of those SOPs. So what does this mean for school leaders? So to me, school leaders must understand that they may no longer rely on their past leadership practices in meeting the current uh, VUCA demands. So how then uh, successful school leaders can use a different VUCA model to build their strategies for, lead, for leading during this crisis. So how do we turn volatility into a vision, uncertainty towards understanding, complexity towards clarity, and ambigu ambiguity towards adaptability? So firstly, how do we first adapt volatility into vision? So school leaders uh, must always retain a clear vision against which judgments can be made. Uh, and this must be done with agility uh, as well as responsively to the rapid and sudden changes as well as challenges. So the situation requires uh, the school leaders to have a certain vision. It may not be the same while our business is still the same, which is on education, which is on teaching and learning, for learning to happen optimally for our students. But then again, uh, the planning that has to be made because of the disruption, because of the volatility, um, it may be a little bit more short term, but definitely it has to be done uh, with a certain vision at the end of it. So it may be difficult to predict the volatility of COVID-19 and its impact on school closures. Nevertheless, school leaders must ensure that their vision of ensuring that students will learn, continue to learn, um, would remain unchanged in many circumstances. Setting the leadership vision during the pandemic is critical, especially in establishing what matters most, which is student learning. So if in the pre-COVID-19, you know, there's a lot of socialization that happens uh, other than the actual uh, learning of uh, various aspects of education. But then during the COVID-19 situation in school, uh, such uh, is no longer the same. We do, when children are in school, we need to comply uh, with the SOPs, with the guidelines that's available. Uh, there should be distancing, physical distancing, how much distancing uh, is all stipulated within uh, the guidelines. And what happens when, uh, you know, schools have to be closed, either because of the MCO 
or because there are positive cases within the school and our um, uh, health office uh, require uh, has given their directives to close schools then uh, learning from home needs to kick in although you know all other schools may be open but for cases of COVID-19 or in terms of uh, where many of the students and especially when teachers need to be quarantined and the school cannot operate uh, during this situation, school when schools are closed, uh, teaching and learning still needs to happen uh, from home. Now, how do we then look at uncertainty into understanding? Uh, with their vision, leaders need in-depth understanding of their organization's capabilities and strategies to take advantage of uh, the rapid changes and by uh, using their strength uh, to manage uh, those changes. Uh, for example, uh, le school leaders would need perhaps to strengthen their distributed leadership, uh, thus understanding the capabilities of their teachers uh, is paramount because it would allow the school leaders to distribute leadership and fully maximize the potential benefits of empowering uh, others within the school. Now, this is crucial as the school leaders must allow teachers to take lead and make judgment calls during uh, this time. We clearly see in many uh, of our schools, especially when we reopen schools, for instance, how are schools managing uh, when students come in? Uh, they have to comply with certain uh, SOPs, such as taking the temperature. Uh, what if the temperature is above 37.5? What do the school then needs to do? What if students do show uh, signs that they are uh, infected? What do the schools then do? Uh, how do we then manage when, to, when the students are within the school? How is the direction within the school? How is the teaching and learning happening within the classrooms? How do we manage the break times? How do we then manage dispersal? from school. So all this require effort, not just on the one leader or the middle layer leaders alone, but it requires a concerted effort from the whole team uh, within the school uh, to help manage in the operations of school in this current situation. So how do we also manage complexity into clarity. So now school leaders must have the cl clarity about the purpose, priorities, the process, performance, problems to be solved. And this would enable higher productivity, better decision making, more effective and timely problem solving and more relevant action. Now all of which would lead to higher levels of performance for the students, teachers and schools as a whole. This clarity also makes uh, people within the organization perhaps uh, happier in terms of them being more engaged with their work. And it is also key to an outstanding uh, performance. So this we have seen also in many schools where uh, schools that have managed uh, to engage their whole team uh, within the school uh, with an understanding of what role each needs to play and to support uh, will, will show uh, better compliance uh, in meeting uh, the SOPs as well as in better and systematic management uh, of the reopening and operations of schools. Now, in terms of adapting Ambiguity. Uh, ambiguous environment or scenarios can be overcome by providing clear direction and also to synchronize efforts uh, of the team of teachers 
while uh, communicating continuously and making adjustments uh, in the process uh, because the situation is complex and we learn as we go along in some instances. Uh, thus, uh, adjustments need to make, but those adjustments need to have clarity and be properly communicated within the whole school community. Uh, this would eliminate any form of ambiguity uh, for not just for the school leader, but also in how he or she works uh, with the other teachers uh, within the school and to go about uh, managing and uh, the operations of the schools uh, with collaboration. So in the case of home-based uh, learning, for instance, school leaders need to understand the context of the schools, the capability of the teachers, uh, access of communication uh, among the students and the parents in order to carry out the uh, home-based learning. So while we do have a manual on home-based learning, which has been improved, uh, as we understand it more and what issues that uh, people are facing. Uh, but then again, the manual is not a one size fits all uh, solution uh, because we know that there are differences uh, between schools. There are differences between classes, even within a school. Thus, the teacher would know best on how to manage uh, the home-based learning. But then again, uh, we need the school leader to oversee the overall operations of the home-based learning. And how do you schedule uh, the home-based learning to happen? And how do you monitor to ensure that the home-based learning um, follows through uh, efficiently? So this role has to be taken up by the school leader or, uh, or the team of leadership be, uh, within the school. So I think uh, a lot of emphasis uh, have been based on, the te on technology as the enabler uh, in order to adopt, to adapt quickly uh, to the current uh, situation. So someone has asked me, uh, is it only during the COVID-19 situation or is it here to stay? I think the Ministry of Education has already started to embark on uh, digital education. But I believe the COVID-19 situation has facilitated uh, and has also made it even more important for us to embark on digital education and digital learning, uh, not just uh, within the current situation, but going forward as well. So important among our school leaders and our teachers is on how they can now uh, quickly take up uh, digital technology. So we have seen efforts by our teachers where in the first uh, PKP or MCO, um, teachers were struggling, but they learn. They learn, they adjust themselves. So when the third wave happened, a lot more of our teachers had improved and were able to do online learning, for example. At first, we may provide uh, modules in the form of exercises to our students. But then across time, we have also changed those modules in terms of exercises into self access learning modules. So other than just the exercises, there were also sections for students to first read, understand before it's reinforced with the exercises. So I think the improvements are important. But then for the improvement to happen, we also need to understand what are some of the issues. For instance, in terms of using the technology as an enabler, um, 
of importance i said just now was the vision of the leaders but when we look here on how uh, the star rating one uh, one is the lowest and five is the highest the best so if we look here uh, we see certain charts here where um, the red would denote where it is the weakest so here we see uh, the box on kepimpinan berwawasan the visionary leader here uh, is a lot more lacking and second is the pembelajaran berpusatkan murid student centered learning so which are very important when we talk about in digital learning so we need the direction from the school leaders for instance uh, as well uh, when digital learning happens it's not the same as face to face learning it has to be more student centered it has to be interactive because you need to engage because you are not uh, having face to face um, you are not in physical contact uh, you are online so these two components while they are very important but they are also among the weakest so i think if we want to accelerate and move towards uh, digital learning and definitely digital education definitely these two components has to be uh, developed further among our leaders as well as our teachers the other is to provide the support that's required uh, among others is the emotional support uh, we need to be able to understand uh, the emotional well-being and needs of our teachers as well as our students and provide based on the needs that's required uh, because there has been many instances where teachers students parents are un under stress uh, because of certain constraints uh, that they are facing and carrying out home-based learning so what kind of professional development programs for instance that we can provide for teachers because when we were forced into the situation definitely we did not have time to provide the support that's required for our teachers for instance but across time while we are facing the situation what kind of support we can continue to give uh, to our teachers so i think this is where the emphasis is given uh, this year uh, from last year and also more so this year uh, the kind of professional support that will enable uh, teachers uh, to uh, provide this digital learning or digital education and definitely on the social emotional competencies uh for themselves as well as the students the other is i think one of the um theme that i tried to um put across uh since last year and this year as well is togetherness to work together a uh, culture of collaboration uh that was mooted even before march uh, 2020 but then when i relooked at what uh, when i reflected on uh, the message that i have tried to convey i realized that it, it it is even more so important in the situation that we are facing now and forward because in the covid situation definitely um, the ministry at the federal level for instance alone cannot do it by themselves uh, we require the different layers to also play their part as well right up to the school level and it's not just the education fraternity within uh, the ministry or ambit of the ministry of education but also the various stakeholders and parties needs to be also involved because the situation as I have said earlier is voca requires insights ideas and to then take the appropriate action by all so it's not only the schools but also people 
other parties outside the school as well um, to uh, bring about the change uh, collaboratively. So the culture of collaboration is very important. For instance, even in the simple uh, activity of dispersing uh, students, how do we avoid students clustering together and everyone uh, you know, leaving the school in a more systematic way uh, without physical contra uh, contact, without overcrowding, that requires a lot of um, management on the part of teachers, but also I have seen parents, uh, the PTAs, uh, coming in to support that process as well. You will be able to see police also outside the school. Um, streets have been made single um, one way you know to enable a uh, school dispersal to happen quickly and efficiently you see uh, volunteers you see rela uh, ngos also supporting that single one activity so other activities have also been supported uh, by many others and the ministry definitely appreciate all this effort uh, provided uh, in order to ensure that uh, learning can continue to happen and in uh, an ordin uh, or orderly manner. And it is not just when we want to bring back uh, students to school that it needs to happen in such a way, but even in the uh, home-based learning, for instance, the modules that are produced, uh, in terms of the guideline which was launched earlier, these are all supporting you know, the students, the teachers, the parents in how we manage things in uh, the situation that we are facing. So in this VUCA world, which has been uh, amplified uh, by the COVID-19, school leaders must provide clarity, direction, uh, build the resilience and instill hope. Uh, school leaders must remain focused on the best possible outcomes for their students and school communities. So I think I will stop there for now. If there are questions to take. Thank you, Dr. Habiba, for your sharing. I think there's lots of information there your idea of uh, the VUCA and also the counter of VUCA. Uh, and it's very heartwarming to see what have, what the parents and societies are doing uh, to, to come together uh, to help uh, the, ease the situation, uh, both in, in off-site learning or even to disperse the students. I just want to ask that uh, the, on the 27th of March, uh, the Prime Minister announced uh, uh, accelerating the digitalization of education. So is that part of what you're planning at the moment at the ministry? Yes, definitely. Uh, he spoke about DASA Pendidikan Digital, uh, digital education policy. So when he uh, spoke about it, uh, we already had a frame of what we, were, we are trying to do, but we are now detailing out uh, what this policy is about and what some of the strategies as well as initiatives that, you know, that may be quick wins or maybe we need to do in a more uh, longer term, uh, you know, uh, uh, approach. So it is in the process and we need to do it quickly because it has already been announced. <laughs> so yeah, I it think, has been announced. Uh, <laughs> Public and uh, it's talk about uh, collaboration with UAE and and other countries uh, outside of Malaysia. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That too. So it's yeah. quite heartening to see that you know uh, other countries too would like to support the initiative that we are doing. Okay. Thank you, Rato. Uh, I, I think we have a few questions from our audience. Uh, here is one from uh, Cikgu Taufik, so a teacher here. He's asking how to deal with teachers or students who are unable to adapt with technological changes due to this COVID issue. I think I think maybe there are two perspectives we'll look at this. Uh, one is from uh, the teachers themselves, teachers and students. One is from the leadership. How are the school leaders should do 
when they have teachers and students who cannot uh, adapt to the technological changes? That's all. Um, I think we cannot avoid that technology is here to stay. and It's in the form of digital technology. So we need to bring everyone on board. Uh, it's not because of the COVID situation alone. Uh, that's why there has been questions like this, as well as, you know, you uh, the ministry would like to provide uh, some form of access to notebooks, for instance. So what if you bring back the children to school? Do you still need those notebooks? Uh, I think um, we should look not just short term of the situation, but in the longer term, how do we uh, change towards uh, this digital learning and digital education itself? So if we did, uh, I think uh, if you talk about teachers, for instance, uh, and to me, they are the very important uh, people, group of people that will bring about the change. So in any transformation, I think we, we need to invest on the human resource uh, that will enable uh, the transformation or the change to happen. So definitely change processes requires not just increase in the productivity, but also in the skills uh, that are required among the human resources to enable uh, the change to happen. So if our teachers are lacking in terms of certain competencies uh, in their skills, thus uh, that's where we need to provide uh, and to narrow the gap uh, to empower them uh, to take up on the digital technology. Uh, it's not just the teachers, but also on the school leaders. Because when you align uh, the scores, for instance, from the SSQS, which I shared just now, as well as the competencies among students. So we also measure the digital competencies among our students. So there's a clear positive relationship between uh, how good is the environment uh, within the school to support uh, digital education and the digital competency that's acquired by the students. So if schools or if the school leader or the uh, ecosystem within the school cannot support such uh, an ecosystem that's required for digital education, definitely it will not be translated or efficiently translated into the digital competencies that we want among uh, the students. So it has to go hand in hand. So while we want that to happen among our students, we need to develop among our teachers and our leaders as well uh, to enable it to happen. Uh, thus, if you look at the planning that we have on the professional development of our teachers and leaders, a lot more focus this year is on the digital component. Right. Okay, I think that's that's really uh, timely for us to do it. Uh, I think uh, after one year of uh, the COVID situation, I think teachers have been uh, learning quite fast, uh, students as well. Yeah, that thought, I think there's the one more question coming up um, from Muhammad Iqbal Tariq Idris. Yeah, that thought, thank you for insightful sharing. Is it PDPR still relevant since students already started their physical classes? Um. Yes, because uh, I think we know that our schools um, are in the situation where because we need to do uh, the physical uh, distancing, so some schools remain single session, some schools from single session or they were originally double session, they can still manage double session. But what about those schools that are already crowded and they are already in the double session and they cannot cope uh, with the availability of classrooms because of the distancing? So in such schools, they need to do by rotation. So some classes or some levels will come and then followed uh, by another and so on and so forth. So when the students are in school, when the it is their turn to be in school, then the face-to-face -face teaching and learning can happen. But when it is not their turn to come to school, then the home-based learning still needs to happen uh, regardless. Uh, the other is 
the situation now uh, perhaps may improve, perhaps it may deteriorate. So we don't know. So it may come again where schools need to close, which I hope not, but if it happens. <laughs> and there are also places where schools need to close because uh, teachers or uh, students uh, have become infected and um, we have received directives to close certain schools uh, in such cases, then, you know, uh, it's not that teaching and learning stops, but it still needs to continue. And of course, it's through home-based learning. But I hope in the long term, even though when teaching and learning is already happening face-to-face -face back in school, the situation will not go back to the normal that we used to know. It will be a new normal. And in this new normal, we have spoken about uh, flipped classroom because of the 21st century style of learning. You try to include flipped classroom. So in, the, in that example, for instance, learning needs to happen both in school and at home. Uh, so that's where the home-based learning may still continue. And I hope it will continue because learning is not just in school, but it needs to also happen uh, continuously at home uh, as well. Yeah, that is also the motivation for us to produce that guideline. Although we understand that school has started in March 2021, because we foresee that uh, school, uh, they're going to, parents now realize that uh, they have to guide their own children despite the Correct. school open. So they learned that through uh, the MCO at that time. Um, yes. So I think... Uh, you, you're right, uh, Prof. Atin. Uh, while it has been challenging, and we say that it's a crisis that we need to handle because of the uncertainty, because it's so new, we don't know how to do it. But there have also been lessons that we've learned uh, through the process. And from these lessons, you know, we can improve on how we manage things or how we move forward uh, from from where we are. Exactly, exactly, Dr. Um, I think, uh, would we have time? Uh, let's see if we have more questions. Okay, yes, there was one question from Anis Nadira. How can we ensure all students when they have low access of internet is important here? I think that's what she's trying to ask. Um, uh, how do we ensure that the, the, the student and teachers can work together uh, in online learning when the internet access is quite difficult? Yeah. So that surely is a, is a challenge. Um, I can give you examples, for instance. Our students are, are quite ingenious, actually, because even in places where there is access to internet and they do have devices for instance in oops i shouldn't be saying where but <laughs> but you can see for instance attendance is very high uh, more than 90 percent uh, mm -hmm. because it's all on and you can you can see them but as the classes progress they may switch off the video for instance then you are not sure whether they are actually physically there or not uh, to yeah. follow the classes so you start calling them when you start calling them then you don't hear any responses so you don't know whether they are still there uh, or because there's some uh, technical issues with the connectivity but then uh, i think that's a challenge even do even though we do have uh, connectivity in certain areas, let alone when there's none or uh, where the connectivity is low and, uh, you know, we have uh, more difficulties in reaching out. Uh, but I think um, even before we talk about connectivity, uh, devices alone uh, is also a challenge because, uh, you know, if you don't have the device, there's no point having the connectivity as well. Uh, so it goes uh, both ways. Uh, and I think that's where we are uh, planning to go, where uh, we see the importance of providing not just to school because, uh, you know, in moving forward, if it happens again, uh, the access needs to be with the teachers as well as to the students where they are at the home. And even if it's not because of the COVID situation, but uh, when learning continues 
uh, to happen digitally, you still need to have access to to, uh, to the devices and connectivity. So the ministry is looking into it as well as we need the collaboration of other agencies as well uh, to support uh, what we are trying to do. Mm. I think there's a, there's a, there was a good move in 2018 to move from uh, uh, fraud to GC, Google Classroom. That really helped a lot to, to face the pandemic in 2020. Um, okay, there should be, I think we can only take one more last question. That would be the last question, Dato. Uh, thank you for this informative uh, lecture. I understood that it is required for teach school leaders to monitor how home-based learning takes place. Look at the high percentage of teachers prefer the use of WhatsApp. You were presenting in 97% of teachers who would like to use WhatsApp. How can school leaders closely monitor uh, this kind of teaching using WhatsApp? Because we, we don't join the WhatsApp group. Yeah. So I think we are not uh, currently, we are not monitoring the direct um, uh, things that's happening within the teacher and the students, but we do have uh, daily reporting of what happens during uh, the home-based learning. So those kind of reports actually uh, is quite important to the ministry for us to monitor how uh, the uh, home-based learning is happening. And that's where we get this kind of information as well. Uh, but other than the daily monitoring, we also do surveys uh, so the survey that we did uh, during the first COVID, uh, uh, the MCO uh, situation, which I think needs to uh, do, we need to do another uh, to understand how it has improved across time. So those kind, because the situation is so unique and so new, so those kind of uh, daily monitoring as well as the studies that we do is very uh, important for us uh to continuously have such uh, information for our decision making and moving forward so definitely um the kind of question that's asked uh, today uh, is most pertinent uh, and very helpful uh, in thinking through uh, what we need to do yep. I definitely learned a lot from today's session because uh, we at UTM we also facing problems with online learning uh, also we need to have quite a uh, very agile leadership uh, to face the the VUCA situation. I think I, I, I love about VUCA in terms of the, 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 the negative side of it, but I didn't <laughs> I didn't know there's a there's a there's a VUCA to encounter uh, the the original VUCA. So I, I think I've learned a lot today. Uh, I think what we need to do there's there's a lot that we need to learn. But I think uh, the thing that makes changes that that bring creative ideas among teachers and leaders in school to to go through walk through this pandemic uh, at the moment is the love uh, of, of education the love toward the schools and the students i think that kind of that that big heart is something that we have among our teachers our school leaders including you yourself so we can work together and try to get past this uh, situation, this book has situation together. So uh, with that, you have your last uh, comments before we close the session. <laughs> actually, there's a lot of comment, but... Uh, okay, yeah. please go on. We have about <laughs> five minutes. Yes. Yeah, actually, I tried to share what Buka means in a different sense of the implications to the leaders. Uh, there's a lot more that can be elaborated, a lot of examples, but I need to keep uh, to the time. Uh, and I think while many say that, you know, there are a lot of things that needs to be done in 2020, which cannot be done. And also we cannot start off, uh, you know, as we planned for 2021, because we wanted to bring back uh, uh, to school, uh, the teachers as well as the students in January, but we could only bring back the uh, exam classes. But then again, if we reflect on what we have achieved in 2020 and 2021, uh, I think there has been many successes. Uh, while the situation is a challenge, but we have come up with many ways and approaches uh, on how we uh, handle and manage uh, those situations. Uh, while we may be satisfied with certain things, we try to improve along the way. And to me, that is very important. Only now, we shouldn't be trying to go back to our original situation. But how do we move forward 
uh, in this new situation that's created, uh, you know, to successfully uh, improve and continue to improve uh, the best way we can. Yeah, I agree with that. We cannot go walk back to the the previous way of doing things now. It's, it's the new normal. I think everyone should and must accept this as how we should do things differently now. Uh, so I think, uh, Dato, thank you so, so much uh, for thank your you. time. Uh, I, I think this is the last lecture uh, that you have with us as our adjunct professor. And I'm informed that you're going to retire soon. <laughs> yes, my uh, my last day is on the 5th of April, which is next Monday. Right. Okay. Um, I think we're surely going to miss you. But but we, you're still going to be with us and I'll, I'll try to arrange something after that, inshallah. Thank you, <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, Dato. I uh, well, hope to see you soon, inshallah. Thank you. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikum salam. Okay, that's it of, of, uh, for our lecture today with uh, Dato, uh, Dr. Habibah Abdurrahim, the Director General of Education, Ministry of Education, on the school leadership in times of crisis. I think we've learned so much from Dato, the information that she has given us, uh, her thoughts. I think we can see how much that she loves the education, how much that she wants to see things happening in schools, the growth among our kids and the change that she needs to see among the leaders at school. So that uh, I think we can work together on this. Uh, there's a lot of things we can do as a civil society. Everyone can chip in. It's not just school, not just teachers, not just parents, but civil society can come together and we can uh, go to this together, inshallah. With that, uh, I would like to pass the session to Dr. Tan, our MC today. Dr. Tan. Thank you, Prof. Fatin, and thank you so thank much you. again uh, to you as the mod moderator of today's session and also um, our honourable speaker, Dr. Habiba, for this solid one-hour talk on the importance of Calteract VUCA to asserting leadership in school in times of COVID pandemic particularly. So I learned a lot actually from today's session and look forward to learning more from that talk. So for those of you who have missed it, do not worry, as you can still watch the session on our faculty's Facebook and YouTube pages. Don't forget to subscribe and follow us. Again, a reminder for UTM staff and students to register your attendance by clicking on the link that has been shared in the comment section. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have come to the end of today's event. I'm Ivy Tan and I would like to thank all of you for your active participation for the past hour or so. We hope you have had a fruitful and joyous session and we look forward to seeing you again in our next adjunct professor talk by Dr. Freda on curriculum de delivery and syllabus development in Champaka schools. Thank you so much and goodbye.